God's greatest provision is His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the first message in the series, Hallowed Be Your Name, Discovering the God of Promises. The message is entitled, The God Who Provides. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. Hi, Pastor Dale here. Thank you so much for being with us this weekend here at Church of the Redeemer. We're so glad that you're here. For those of you that are joining us online, we welcome you as well. Of course, I want to give a good welcome also to all the folks in Frederick this weekend. I'm very excited about a new series of messages we're going to be involved in for the next several weeks. I'm going to be sharing some principles of God's Word myself. There'll be others that will be sharing along uh, this summertime with us as well as we take a look at the names of God and also primarily the promises that come from God's name. So we're going to dive in today with our first message. I want to talk to you this weekend about the God who provides, the God who provides. Let me give you a little bit of an introduction. You know, getting to know God is one of the most extremely Uh, important and valuable things you'll ever do in your life, knowing who God is. And knowing God better makes us better. I want to emphasize that. When you get to know God better, it's going to improve the quality of your life and improve the quality of all of your relationships. I think it's uh, very basic and foundational that we understand that getting to know God uh, is a relational thing. It's not a religion we're talking about, and the Bible's very clear about how we get to know God. We get to know God through His Son, Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 14, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father except by me. And so we enter into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, what He did for us on the cross of Calvary, what He did in His resurrection as well, the fact that He proved He was the Son of God. And then in relationship with God, we still need to get to know who God is. We learn some about our Heavenly Father. And one of the, perhaps the best ways that we can get to know God is by studying some of the names of God in the Bible. See, names are very important in Scripture, especially when we talk about the names of God, because the names of God reveal the character and the nature of God. See, God's nature and God's character is so expansive, it is so, uh, if you will, magnificent, that one name is not sufficient to describe his nature and his character. And so throughout the pages of the Bible, we find various unique names of God, uh, especially in the old Hebrew language. We find names that identify the character of God. Now, there are some of these names that are called the compound names of God. And that's what we're going to focus on in this series together. A compound name means a name that's attached to another term. We talk about compound words and how they're connected one to another. And so you'll find in the Old Testament various compound names of God, eight primary compound names of God that all start with Jehovah. Now, Jehovah is perhaps a familiar name to you. It's actually the Latinization of the word or the name of God, Yahweh. And you'll find Jehovah and other words attached to Jehovah to describe various aspects of the names of God. Jehovah or Yahweh means I am that I am or I am who I am. And of course, we see that first revealed to Moses uh, as he experienced the reality of who God was. We also are going to see it today as we talk about Abraham. And I want to share with you an important first uh, name of God that we'll look at together uh, and starting our series for this summer. I want to talk today about this compound name called Jehovah Jireh. Would you say it with me? Jehovah Jireh. And this name is introduced to us by an experience that Abraham has with God. I want to pick up the story now in Genesis chapter 22. I'll begin in verse number 1. We'll go down through verse number 19 as we see this story that perhaps you're familiar with. It's where we find this name appearing in Scripture. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. 
Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. It's a very important statement that Abraham makes. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Verse 9, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram. It's a, a sheep, if you will, a male, ram, a male goat, a male sheep, I should say. A ram caught by its thorns, he went, by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. Or he called that place Jehovah Jireh. He called the place where this event transpired, where he sees the ram provided by God. And he says, this is the place where God has revealed himself to me as my provider. And to this day, it continues in verse 14, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time, and he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. The question is, what do we learn from this story? So many things we can learn from this story, but again, our focus today is really on this particular name that was revealed to Abraham, and four things that I want us to learn today from this story about this name of God. First of all, we learn very clearly that God identifies himself to us as a provider. Clearly in this story, God revealed himself to Abraham as Jehovah Jireh, the God who is, the Jehovah, I am, Yahweh, provider, Jireh, I provide for you everything that you have need of. Now, this story really is, a, sto is a story of God giving Abraham an assignment and then God actually providing everything that Abraham needed to fulfill the assignment that was given to him by God. So in this story, Abraham saw God in action. He saw God doing something as a provider for him, as his personal provider by providing the ram in place of his son Isaac to lay on that altar of sacrifice. And so we're learning something about the character and nature of God from this story in this name, Jehovah Jireh, that God is our provider. And I want to remind you this weekend that God is and wants to be your provider. This is the beginning point in knowing and trusting God. If you do not believe that God can and will provide for you, it's going to be very hard for you to truly and personally trust Him. But when we know God as our provider, as our Jehovah Jireh, we experience some tremendous blessings in our life. I'm going to give you five things that will happen in your life when you begin to realize that God truly is your provider. First of all, it will free you from anxiety. It will free you from fear. See, when you know that God is your provider, you don't have to worry about your needs. You don't have to worry about any aspect of your life. You know that God will take care of you, that God will supply everything that you need. Therefore, fear and worry has no place in your life. Jesus emphasizes this, and we'll read this in just a moment. The second thing that happens is it frees us from self-centeredness. So much of our life, we live with a self-centered focus. We're focused on our own self-protection and our own self-preservation because we're just holding on to make sure we're taken care of. 
But as soon as we know that God is our provider, we have the assurance of this promise from God that he's going to take care of us. We do not have to spend our energy in self-protection and self-preservation. It frees us from self-centeredness. And then thirdly, it frees us from stinginess. I'm going to really delve, delve into this more in just a moment. But so often in life, uh, we have this tendency, as I just mentioned, to hold on to things and to uh, make sure we are taken care of, which keeps us from being free in our giving toward others. But when you know that you're going to be taken care of, you're free to actually give freely to other people. Fourthly, it frees us to do God's will. When you know that God is going to provide for you, you can do whatever he asks you to do, knowing that you're going to be well taken care of. You don't have to worry when you're in the will of God. I love what it's said by some folks. I've heard it many, many times in the past. I would remind you of it today. Where God guides, he always provides. If you are living in the will of God, you're walking in the guidance of God, you can be assured that we're assured of the fact that where God guides, he will always provide. And then fifthly, when we know God as our provider, it positions us for greater blessings and the gifts of God to flow into our lives. Think of it this way. Would you rather provide for you or would you rather God provide for you? Any day, I would much prefer God to provide for me. And so the blessing of God comes by realizing he can take better care of me than, than I can take of myself. As I mentioned a few moments ago, Jesus reemphasized this during his ministry as he's teaching the great sermon on the Mount, the Mount of Beatitudes. In chapter 6 of Matthew, he writes these or gives us these words written by Matthew, inspired by the Holy Spirit. It says, so don't worry about these things. What are these things? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? That's provision. What will we drink? That's provision. What will we wear? That's provision. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. How many needs does God know in your life? He knows all your needs. And then he gives us this instruction. Jesus does. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. God is a provider. I would encourage you to say with me right now, God is my provider. Let's declare it together. God is my provider. He wants to be the source of provision and will be the source of provision in your life. Here's the second lesson for us today. God wants us to have real faith in him as our provider. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. In this story, we see it's introduced to us by the fact that Abraham goes through a test. The Bible, in fact, very clearly says that God tested Abraham by telling him to take his son Isaac and sacrifice him. Of course, God knew that the sacrifice was not going to be something that was, that was required of Abraham, but he's testing Abraham's faith. And so here is Abraham. He's got this long-awaited, miraculous son that's been given to him. He waited 25 years for the birth of Isaac. And then God says, I, I want you to take him to the top of Mount Moriah, and I want you to build an altar, and I want you to sacrifice this precious gift to me. Now, this had to be ex an extremely difficult test for Abraham. It was an extremely personal test for Abraham. Think about it, his very own son. And so what God is testing, it's very clear in verse number one. If you go back and read Genesis 22, 1, it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. What is God testing? God is testing his faith. Do you really believe in me, Abraham? And will you prove that you believe in me? Will you put action to your statement of faith in me? And in fact, Abraham did. How do we know that Abraham had a personal faith in God? We know that he had a personal faith in God by what he said to God and what he said to those around him that day and what he said to Isaac, his very own son, that day and by actually what he did. In fact, Abraham says to his servants as they're going up on the mountain, he says, we're going to go and worship and we will come back to you. And so he's declaring the fact that he believes that God is going to do an amazing miracle. His very words are affirming that he's going to come and come back with Isaac. 
He has this confidence. I'm going to read you a verse at a few moments out of the New Testament that emphasizes this. And in fact, he's confident when Isaac asks him, where's the sacrifice? And he says to Isaac, God will provide. And when there came that moment where Isaac is on the altar, Abraham lifts his knife and begins to take it down when God stops him. But what you see is you see that Abraham declared real faith with his words and with his actions. How do you know that you have a real faith? You know you have a real faith when in the midst of a test, your words are communicating your confidence in God and your actions continue to communicate your confidence in God. That when the test of your faith comes, is God really going to provide? That your words are, yes, I know that God will provide, provide and your actions are continuing to be in obedience to God, even when it seems like you don't understand or you don't know where provision is coming from. Abraham did not know exactly where the provision was coming from, but he was confident that God was his provider, and he passed the test of faith. He had a very real faith. God wants you to have a very real faith in him. In fact, some of you right now are going through a testing of your personal faith in God right now. Can I encourage you to make sure that the words of your mouth, as well as the actions of your life, communicate the fact that you know, even though you may not understand how, you know that God is, will come through for you. Here's our third lesson today as we're talking about this wonderful promise found in the name Jehovah Jireh. And that's that generosity is a sign that we're truly trusting God as our provider. One of the key marks of someone who knows God as provider is real generosity. That when you know that God is going to provide for you, you know that you, you, you can be and you're willing to be and you desire to actually be generous. You see this very clearly in the life of Abraham. Abraham's faith and trust are seen in the fact that he refused to withhold from God the most precious gift in his life, the gift of his son. In fact, in verse 12 of Genesis chapter 22, I'm going to read this for you. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. God's saying this now to him. Now I know that you fear God. Notice this statement, because you have not withheld. Please notice that. You have not withheld from me your son, your only son. See, the opposite of giving is withholding. That's exactly what it means to be stingy. The opposite, the exact antonym we might say of generosity is to withhold, to hold on to. And God says, Abraham, I've seen this about you. I've seen your faith and I've seen your trust in me as, as your provider by the fact that you have not withheld. You've been willing to give up to me your son, your only son. That son that you waited 25 years to be born. You've been willing to, to give it to me. There's been a generosity of spirit. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, we find some interesting words that I want to read for you because it does describe this faith that Abraham very clearly had. It says, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And, and in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. The point that I want to emphasize here is that Abraham was willing to give. There was a generosity to lay on the altar the very thing that was most precious to him. He did not withhold this precious thing in his life. We know that we're trusting God as our provider, that we're truly trusting him when we're willing to generously give to God, when there's a generosity of spirit. And I'm going to mention six things that you need to be generous with God, generous in, in relationship uh, to God with and to others as well. It proves our generosity. First of all, we need to freely give to God the most important part of our life. That's our heart, our will, and our plans. Can I ask you, have you given your heart to God? I mean, have you opened your heart and said, God, I want to love you more than I love anything else. And I, I give you my will that I want to do what you want me to do. I, I don't want to live life my way. I give you my plans. I lay my heart 
I lay my will, I lay my plans on the altar, just like Abraham laid Isaac on the altar. Are you willing to lay your heart, your will, your plans on the altar? Second of all, we need to be willing to lay our stuff on the altar. What stuff? It's your possessions, the stuff that you own, the things that you think really are yours, your time, your treasure, your talents, yes, all those things, but it's the stuff of your life. So many times we try to measure our life by the possessions we gain and hold on to, and sometimes they become the idol of our life that we're not willing to lay on the altar, and God comes along and reminds us of the importance of being willing to release resources from our life to bless the kingdom of God and to bless others. How about your relationships? Are you willing to put your relationships on the altar? What I mean by that is to, to make God first in all your relationships. Then instead of making relationships about you and what you want in life, seeking God's plan, God's will, God's purpose for every relationship, to say every relationship of my life, God is on the altar with you. Fourthly, to lay down our abilities. God, whatever talents or abilities you've given to me, I want to use them for your glory. I want to honor you. I don't want it to be just about me. And I give you, number five, my future. Lord, all that represents the days to come, instead of me spending my time worrying and anxious about what's going to happen tomorrow, God, I put this in your hands. I lay my future on the altar. And God, finally, number six, and it really covers everything, God, I give you my all. Every part of my life, you have it all. Not just part of me, but all I give to you. This is a song that we used to sing and perhaps We'll sing from time to time in the future. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence. Daily live. I surrender all. And so surrendering all to God is the way that we say, God, we're holding nothing back from you. We want to be generous in spirit with every part of our life. There are many, many, many promises in the Bible given to people who express this kind of generosity. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 as God is calling upon his people who've failed to be generous in their, their financial giving. He says to them in chapter 3 again of Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, verse number 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, notice this, says the Lord of, of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. There's an old statement that has often been said about God, and I would really repeat it again today because it's so very true that you can never outgive him. Abraham learned this, and Anyone who's learned to be generous in their giving has learned this as well. You can never outgive God. God says, bring me the tithes and the offerings and see, put me to the test and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing. There's not room enough to receive. It's not just talking about financial blessing. It's talking about living. Yes, it's part of it, but living under the blessing of God in your life, the blessing of God in your family, the blessing of God in your relationships, the blessings of God in your business, the blessings of God in your own your own soul and your own healthiness and of course more importantly and most importantly for your eternity jesus said in luke 6 38 give and it will be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use it will be measured to you second corinthians 9 verse 6 but remember this if you give little you'll get little a farmer who plants just a few seeds will get only a small crop but if he plants much, he will reap much. Philippians 4, 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Over and over and over again, we learn that we cannot outgive God. And when you and I are trusting God as our provider, the mark of that, one of the marks of that will be generosity. It's a sign that we truly have faith in him. Generosity marks that perhaps more than anything else. Abraham demonstrated it. Now let me take you to my final point today. And this is the one I perhaps am most excited about because this is where the story comes to life for us and reveals Jesus to us. God's greatest provision is his son, Jesus Christ. The story of Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah that day, we read it a moment ago from Genesis chapter 22. 
is a story that has much deeper meaning than just the story of Abraham and Isaac and this amazing moment that, that Abraham has learning something about this name of God, Jehovah Jireh. What's true in this story about Abraham and Isaac is most importantly, it gives to us a story of God and his son, Jesus Christ. It's a story that foreshadows, that pictures, that gives us an understanding of what God was going to do for us in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm going to break down the final part of today's message by helping us to see how that story in Genesis chapter 22 reveals Jesus to us in the New Testament and that application for your life and my life today. The greatest provision of all is the provision of Jesus in your life. First of all, we see that Father Abraham represents Father God. It's very clear. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, eternal life. There in that moment as Abraham is laying Isaac on the altar, it's symbolism, it is a foreshadowing of the fact that God would send his very own son into our world and he would become the sacrifice placed on the altar called the cross for you and me. Who does Isaac represent? Well, Isaac represents us, you and I, people that are doomed to die for our sins. There in that moment, Isaac was doomed to die. He was being placed on the altar. Isaac, in fact, was going to be required to die in that moment had God not stepped in, intervened. And the same is true for you and me, that we deserved to die for our sins. That's what Romans 3.23 reminds us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. We're all sinners, and so we all deserve to die for our sins. We deserve to pay the ultimate price, the ultimate sacrifice of giving our life in exchange for our sin. The wages, the Bible says, of sin is death. How about the ram? You remember the story back in Genesis chapter 22 that I read a moment ago? How there in that moment, Abraham is he's about to take his son's life, and the knife is poised over, uh, over the sacrifice Isaac, and God stops him there in that moment, and Abraham looks over in the thicket, over in the, the bushes and the briars, and he finds there there's a ram that's been provided by God, and there's that moment that he says, he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Well, what does the ram represent? The ram represents the Lamb of God, Jesus who God provided to each one of us as a substitute to die in our place for our sins. There in that moment, Isaac got off of the altar and the ram went on to the altar as the substitute for Isaac. Remember, Father Abraham represents Father God. Isaac represents us in our sin. The ram represents Jesus who came and took our place. How do we know this? Listen to these verses. John 1, 29. The next day, John, this is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist recognized that Jesus was that ram. Jesus was the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. Paul the Apostle in Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, deserving to be on that altar, Christ died for us. He took our place. We were able to get up off of the altar, and we did not have to die for our own sins. Jesus, the ram, the lamb, took the place for us. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you declare... With your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. How do we experience this beautiful gift of salvation? We do it by putting our faith in Jesus who took our place. By saying, Jesus, I know that I deserved to be on that altar of sacrifice. But Jesus, I believe that you took my place on the altar of sacrifice and you died for my sins. But you also rose from the grave and my faith, my personal faith is in you. See, following Jesus is not a religion. It's not something that we do religiously. It's not a set of rules that we follow, a set of ordinances that we, we obey. 
We certainly want to obey God's word, but we do so out of a relationship with God. And so knowing God is about a relationship with him, having his spirit living in us and coming to faith in him in a personal way that we know him as Lord of our life. We know that he's redeemed us from our sin that we deserved to die for. And as the ram set Isaac free, the lamb of God sets us free. I think we ought to say a good hallelujah right there. That as the ram set Isaac free. Is that not true? What set Isaac free from the altar that day? It was the ram that took his place. The ram set Isaac free. And just as the ram set Isaac free, Jesus, the lamb of God, sets us free. Galatians 5, 1, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. In John chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus says these words to us, so if the Son, speaking of himself, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And I love Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then we understand that God's generous and sacrificial gift of Jesus has resulted now in many children in his family. Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. God's greatest provision to each one of us is his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Jehovah Jireh. He has provided for us our salvation. God is a provider. God wants you to have real faith in him as your provider. Generosity is always a sign of the fact that you believe that God is your provider. And the greatest provision of all is, is the provision of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Can I ask you today, have you ever invited Jesus into your life? Have you ever made that choice? If you have made that choice, are you living for him fully? Are you devoted to him? Do you appreciate what Jesus has done for you? If you haven't received him, receive him today. If you know him, give him thanksgiving and praise for all that he's done in your life, taking your place, being Jehovah Jireh to and for you. Would you bow your heads together with me as we pray? Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had this weekend to study this wonderful name of God, Jehovah Jireh. Thank you that you are indeed our provider. Lord, we can't imagine what life would be like without that promise, without the promise that you're there to take care of us. In the same way that you provided for Abraham on that mountain day in and day out, you provide for us. Thank you for every moment that you provided blessings for our life. But most importantly, we thank you for the provision of Jesus, the fact that you took our place on that altar of sacrifice, the cross, and you died in our stead so that we could go free. Thank you for the freedom that we find in you. Seal this word in our heart today. May we live every day with the awareness and with the confidence that you are our Jehovah Jireh in Jesus' name. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray and you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God and I promise you that he will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of his name. Say, Jesus, I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out and you become a new creation 
old things pass away, all things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.